Hello, this is Dr. Feng Tian from Governor State University. Today, we will introduce basic probability. In this section, we will learn the concept of event and sample space. We will also introduce basic probability concepts and property. And at the end, we'll talk about the general addition rule. So an event is related with a variable. So basically, each possible outcome of a variable is an event. And depending on how we describe the event, an event can be a simple event or a joint event. For a single event, basically, that is an event described by a single characteristic. For example, if we draw a card from a brick deck, and we only look at the color of the card, then the color will be a simple event. If we draw a card from the bridge deck, but this time we are not only looking at the color, but we also look at the value, which means we use two characteristics to describe the event, then this event will become a joint event. For example, a red ace from a deck of cards here, the color is red and the value is 8. So for any event described by two or more characteristics, then this event will become a joint event. A special event is called complement of an event, which is denoted as A prime. So all events that are not part of event A is called the complement of event A. Now, if we define event A as diamond, and then all cards that are not diamond will be the complement of event A, which is the diamond card. Sample space. Sample space is a collection of all possible events. Here, we emphasize it should be the collection of all possible events. For example, if we roll a dice, well, dice has six values. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So all six faces of a dice will become the sample space of rolling a dice. And uh, if we look at a bridge deck, then all 52 cards will become the sample space of the bridge card. Now, how to represent the card at an event visually? Continuous table is a very powerful tool if we want to present a joint event. Let's take a look at an example. Here we try to present the, the event of a bridge deck. Now we know the total numbers are 52, which is the sample space. And here we use two characteristics. One is the color. They can be separated into black or red. And the other one is we look at the cards and try to separate the ace from the rest of the card. So ace or not ace will be the other property of the event. So two properties, ace, not ace, black or red. These are the two characteristics we use to describe the a card. Now, if we look at the number 24, which is circled here, so 24, this is the number of red and not ace, so it will be the joint event, red and not ace. Another tool is called a decision tree. So decision tree basically is break the whole sample space into different categories, but with the we divide it into different categories, follow each of the characteristics. For example, here we look at the same example. We have a full deck of 52 cards. And at first, we take a look at the color. Well, we have black card and red card. So we separated the whole 52 cards into two categories, black and red. This is the first property we follow. And then next, we take a look at the the face value of the card. 
and pick ace and not ace from the the card. Now we can see if we look at the first two follow the branch from the beginning to these two we have black card ace which means we have two black ace in the whole deck of card. And the second 24 we, means that we have 24 black card cards that are not ace. So containers table and decision tree are decision trees are two very powerful tools to present an event. Another important visual tool is called a Venn diagram. Now here we define the two uh, event as A is ace and B is red card and uh, the relationship between these two event a draw on this diagram. Now we have A, B, because there are some card cards that are ace and red, so these two events have some overlap. Have overlap. This overlap is ace and red, which is also called A and B, which means both of this this part belongs to both of these two events. A and B. And uh, if we look at the sum of the two, which is called ace or red, that is called A or B. So Venn diagram can display the relationship between different events very easily. We can see whether or not we have overlap or we do not have overlap. And we can also easily identify an event and its complement from the Venn diagram as well. There are some unique properties we need to know about the event. The first one is called a mutually exclusive event. Mutually exclusive event. Now see here it is called mutually exclusive event. So which means the property involves at least two events. It means events that cannot occur simultaneously or cannot occur at the same time if two events cannot occur at the same time, then these two events are mutually exclusive. For example, if we draw a card from a deck and we define the two events, A is queen of diamond, B is queen of clubs. Now, if we draw a card, it will be either queen of diamond or queen of club or none of them but you cannot draw a card that is both Queen of Diamond and Queen of Clubs. So event A and B here are mutually exclusive. Another example is if we toss a coin, the result will either be tail or head, but you cannot toss a coin. Of course, if it is a fire coin, you cannot get tail and head at the same time. So the event head and tail are mutually exclusive as well. An event and its complement are always mutually exclusive because we defined an event's complement as any event that is not part of the original event is called its complement. So an event and its complement cannot occur at the same time. So they are mutually exclusive. Another property we introduce is collectively exhaustive event. Collectively exhaustive events is a set of event, but this set of event covers the entire sample space. It covers the entire sample space. It means, well, any event belongs to this sample space must belong to one, at least must belong to one of this set of event, which means one of the event must occur. Now let's take a look at an example. We define four events. Event A is all aces. Event B is all black cards. Event C are all diamonds. And event D are all hearts. Now, these four events, A, B, C, and D, they are collectively exhaustive because 
they covers all 52 cards or any card we draw from the deck must belong to one of them but they are not mutually exclusive because we can have black ace we can have diamond ace we can have heart ace so a have overlap with b c and d but if we only look at b c and d black heart diamond and heart these three events are collectively exhaustive and they are mutually exclusive so any two of them cannot occur at the same time so this example shows that uh, collectively exhaustive events do not need to be mutually exclusive but mutually exclusive events can be collective exhaustive after we define the event the next step is we need to define the probability so what is probability basically probability is a chance that an event will occur this number is defined between 0 and 1 so if you have any value of the probability that is negative or you have any probability that is greater than 1 which means there is something wrong a probability can only be between 0 and 1 it cannot be negative it cannot be greater than 1 this is a very important concept you need to remember all the time when the probability equal to 0 it means an event will never occur we call it impossible event when the event is sure to occur then we assign the probability 1 to this event and it is called a certain event well for most of the time we are looking at events that have probability between 0 and 1 depend on the event a probability can be a simple probability or a joint probability simple probability refers to the probability of a simple event for example when we draw a card from a deck what is the probability that we draw a king or what is the probability that we draw a heart these two are examples of simple probability now if we draw a card from bridge deck but now we look at whether or not we can draw a heart and a king so the value of king and heart are the two characteristics we use to describe the card so king and heart is a joint event the corresponding probability draw a king and heart is a joint probability now let's take a look at an example this is the continuous table we constructed earlier that uh, describe a, a deck of cards now we have 52 cards the sample space are these 52 cards and the cards are classified into two, cat two uh, characteristics the first one is whether or not it is an ace the second one is the color of the card black or red if we look at the the first example is we draw a card randomly draw a card from the deck what is the probability that we draw a black card here we only look at the color of the card black or white a black or red now this is a simple probability and uh, the example is the probability is 26 divided by 52 because in this sample space there are a total of 52 events and among these 52 events 26 of them belong to the event black so the probability that we draw a black card is 26 divided by 52 also if we only look at the probability that we can draw an ace the probability will be 4 divided by 52 because in this sample space there are total 52 cards and only four of them are ace now joint probability example what is the probability that we draw a black ace here the value ace and the color black are used at the same time so black ace is 
a, a joint event, the corresponding probability is a joint probability. Now, we take a look at the whole sample space, which is 52, and uh, among these 52 cards, only two of them are black eights. So the probability that we draw a black ace is 2 divided by 52. Now, let's take a look at another probability, which is, what is the probability that we draw a card? This card is red, but it is not an ace. Now, the color red and not ace are the two characteristics we use to describe this event. Now, among the 52 cards, 24 of them are red and are not ace. So the probability we draw a red and not ace is 24 divided by 52. Now please pay attention to how a continuous table can be used in both a simple probability and joint probability problem. Now we talk about an event, we talk about a probability. Many of you may be curious about, well, how can I get this probability? I know I need to assign all the probability is the likelihood that an event will occur. So there are usually three ways to assign the probability or to assess the probability of an uncertain event. The first one is called a, a priori probability. It is based on the priori knowledge of the process. A good example is assuming we roll a dice. If I ask you what is the probability that we got a six? You will all tell me it's one out of six. Why? We don't do any study here. Because we assume that the dice is a fair dice and uh, a dice has only six possible outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And if it is a fair dice, then each of these values have the same probability to occur. So any single value of these six values has a probability of 1 out of 6 to occur if we roll it. So this is an example of a priori probability, which basically is based on our knowledge of the process itself. The second one is empirical probability. A good example is actually the survey result. Well, we don't know what the process is, or we don't know the detail of the process, but we can always go ahead to start a part of it. We do the survey and try to talk with part of the population and look at this survey result. Then we can do some summary and the summary can give us some estimated probability of the, of the event we're interested in. Or the third one is subjective probability, which basically is based on a combination of an individual's past experience, personal opinion or some analysis of a particular situ situation. Basically, a human being will decide how to assign the probability to each of the event. A good example is when we do the business plan, usually we need to do an estimation about uh, what will be the possible sales in the future. For a lot of time, people will give you, well, what will be the worst case? What will be the best case? What will be the most likely case? And under each of the circumstance, what will be the possible sales, and also what is the likelihood that each of these scenario will occur? Well, this is an example of subjective probability because when people decide the value of this different scenario, they make the decision just based on their personal judgment. Now let's take a look at an example and see how we solve a probability uh, problem. Now here, we're doing a study in a metropolitan area and try to understand the consumer's behavior. We draw a sample of 500 respondents in a large metropolitan area. Among the questions asked was, do you enjoy shopping for clothing? Out of 240 males, 136 answered yes. Out of the 260 females, 224 answered yes. 
Now we're trying to answer the following questions. What is the probability that a respondent chosen at random enjoys shopping for clothing? Or what is the probability that a random choose respondent is a female and enjoys shopping for clothes? And what is the probability that a random chosen respondent is a female or enjoy shopping for clothing? Now, to answer this question, we look at the given information. First, we need to understand what is the event we define here, what is the sample space. And of course, it can be called that we have a sample of 500 respondents. So the 500 will be our will be our uh, sample space. Now to describe this 500 respondent, we need to take a look at how many characteristics we use to describe it, or how many properties we use. Now the first one is actually the gender. The gender, we have 240 males and 260 females. So the first characteristic to define or to classify the 500 respondent are the gender. The second one is actually, well, what's the answer to the question, do you enjoy shopping for clothing? Well, there are only two choices, yes or no. So basically, we have these two dimensions or these two characteristics to classify the whole sample space. Now, for these two dimension characteristics or the two dimension event, Two property joint event. A contingency table will be a straightforward tool to use. Now we construct the contingency table here. We have the column corresponding to the answer to the question Do you enjoy shopping for clothing? And the row corresponding to the gender, male or female. The four Bodied numbers 136, 240, 224, and 260 are the given information from the question. It mentioned that we have 240 female, uh, 240 male, 260 female. And among the 240 male, 136 enjoy, answered yes. And uh, among the 260 females, 224 answered yes. With this given four numbers, it's easy for us to fill up the whole continuous table. For example, well, 240 male, 136 answered yes. Of course, 104 answered no. And uh, similarly, we can find that among the 260 female, only 36 answered uh, no to the question. The first question asks us, what's the probability that a random chosen respondent enjoys shopping for clothing? So first, here, we only look at one characteristic, is the answer to the question, enjoy whether or not you enjoy shopping for clothing. The answer is yes. So what is the probability that we randomly choose a respondent and he answered yes to the question? Now, the whole sample space is 500. And among these 500 people, 360 answered yes. Now, look at here. The 360 is not given directly in the question. That is what we calculated. Because this question asks us only the answer to the question. It didn't ask us about the gender information. So we don't need to consider the gender. The 360 people who answered yes includes 136 male and 224 female. But it doesn't matter. We only care about the answer to the question. The second question is, what is the probability that a random chosen respondent is a female and enjoys shopping for clothing? Now we look at the table, answer yes, and female, the number is 224. So 224 female, females answer yes to the question. So the probability will be 224 divided by 500, because here we still look at the whole sample space. We randomly choose from these 500 people. And what is the probability that this respondent is a female and enjoys shopping for clothing? 
Next, we look at the last question. Here, we're looking at the probability that a random chosen respondent is a female. All enjoy shopping for clothing. Now, here we look at two characteristics. Female. All enjoy shopping for clothing. So this is the joint event, but this joint event includes two parts. The first part is female, 260. But 260 only is part of this event. We're looking at female. For female, it doesn't matter if she enjoys shopping for clothing or not. So it doesn't matter her answer to the question. This is the first part of this event. Second part is all enjoy shopping for clothing. So for those men who answered yes to the question, they should also be included in this event. Female all enjoy shopping for clothing. So when we look at the probability, we need to include these two parts, all females and the part of males who answered yes to the research question. And the corresponding probability will be 136 plus 260 divided by 500, which gave us a probability that a random chosen respondent is a female or enjoys shopping for clothing. Now, for the continuous table, from the previous example, we can see that if we are looking at a simple probability, we just look at the last column or last row, which is the corresponding total values. Now, the last column summarized event A, so we only differentiate it based on property A, and the last uh, row only separate the event by the property B. So with these two total values, we can calculate the simple probability or the marginal probability. If we look at the joint probability, we always need to look at the center of the continuous table. Now let's take a look at a, a, look at a, a general addition rule. Remember previously we asked the question, Female all enjoys shopping. Now, this all is actually an addition. Means we are looking at the addition of two parts, the first one and the second one. So, the general addition rule says that the probability of A or B, here A and B are two events equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus probability A and B. So if we look at the previous example, it will be probability of female plus the probability of enjoy shopping for clothing minus the probability female and enjoys, enjoys uh, shopping for clothing. Now, one special case is if A and B are mutually exclusive, then there is no overlap between A and B. The probability of A and B will be zero. Then the rule can be simplified to probability of A plus probability B. But be careful, this exists only when A and B are mutually exclusive. Actually, a Venn diagram is a good example to see why we need to subtract the probability of A and B from the summation of probability of A and probability of B. Now this is the example of A and B and their relationship. Now we see the green one is prob the event A and the, the purple one is event B. Because they have overlap, if we use probability A, P A plus P B, then we can see the middle part or the overlap part A and B actually is counted twice. It has got double counted. It is counted once in P A and it is counted another time in P B. So we need to subtract it from P A plus P B so to get rid of the influence of this double count. Now back to the question. 
What is the probability that a random chosen respondent is a female all enjoys shopping for clothing? Here we have the two events. The first event is female. The second event is enjoys shopping. Now we can see the part of female and enjoys shopping, the 224, actually is counted twice. If we only look at female or, or and only look at the enjoy shopping. So the 260 female includes this 224 and the 360 enjoy shopping also includes this 224. Now based on the general addition rule the probability is PA plus PB minus PA and B. PA is the probability of female total 260 female. PB is the people who enjoy shopping for clothing, which is 360. We add this, them up, but we need to subtract the overlap or the joint part, which is 224, and divide by the total event in the sample space, which will give us the same result as we got before.